Hey everyone, my name is Christopher Shedo, also known as Veje on the internet. And I've done a few things for the React community. I co-created React Native, Prettier, Excalibur, CSS in JS. But today I want to talk about something different. I want to talk about video editing in the browser. So during the pandemic, I spent a lot of time uh, doing video editing. And I, I was even thinking maybe I should go like become a YouTuber full time. But then I realized that with this number of views, I should probably keep my job as a software engineer uh, for a bit longer. So what does it mean to edit videos? So I used a tool called Final Cut Pro, and I felt that it was built like many, many years ago and didn't have all of the AI advancements that we've seen uh, recently. So for example, I bought a $20 green screen and I needed to pick the green color and the range in order to remove it. And as you can see, there's some shadows uh, behind me uh, in the picture and it wasn't properly removed. Then in order to cut, I want to know like what am I actually saying to know which part I should be cutting. But I only got the sound waves and not the actual words spoken. On the other side, I was looking at the JavaScript, like the browser news, and I saw like a lot of super exciting stuff happening. So we can start doing encoding and decoding with web codecs. Uh, TensorFlow.js lets you uh, remove the background uh, from the video. And then Whisper is letting you uh, take what I'm saying into actual words. And so we had seemingly all of the building blocks in order to be uh, able to do like a really good video editor powered by AI. But unfortunately, I wasn't able to get all the way there. And this talk is going to be the story of why. So usually when I walk into like some new product like this, there's some like things that I think are true that I'm going to use to base uh, all of the things I'm doing uh, upon. But there were three things in this case that were not true. So the first one is that time only travels forward. The second is that when you encode one frame, you're getting one frame back. And finally, that Wasm is faster than JavaScript for video decoding. So if you want to know why this is not true, buckle up, uh, we're getting into it. So let's start uh, with thinking about like making a video. And unfortunately, I cannot be here in person today. So what I decided to do was to bring some of the sunny California uh, to Amsterdam. And for this, uh, I put a palm tree uh, in all of the pictures. So uh, in this case, we have like React Summit uh, in the background and then like moving to the foreground and the palm tree like fading away. So what would be the API that I would expect uh, to be able to do that? So I initially wanted like a load video kind of API that takes a file pass and returns me like a list of images. And then I'm going to modify the images, remove the background, like cut and paste and a bunch of stuff. And then like a save video that would take the file pass and render and uh, like a list of images and like actually save the video. So Unfortunately, this API cannot exist. So let's see why. So let's go into like one image of this whole video and not too big, not too small, like a thousand by thousand image. And how large is it actually to represent this? So it's going to be like 1000 by 1000 pixels, uh, about one uh, megabyte. And then there's a red, green and blue and so we are about like four megabytes in size. And this is just for one image. Now, uh, if you want like 60 FPS, like one second, you're going to be at like 200 megabytes for every single second. So this talk right now is around 20 minutes. So this is going to be big. And this is actually going to be too big uh, for uh, the browser or like any uh, like computer right now. And what do we do? So fortunately, a lot of very smart people have worked on this for years. And what they built is a shrinking machine. Well, not exactly. What people have been doing is image compression. 
And so I'm going to talk uh, for like the next few minutes around like different types of image compression and not because I find it interesting, which I do, but because they actually have a big uh, factor into the actual API used for video encoding. So let's see uh, the, the main ideas around video encoding. So, uh, sorry, about image compression. So if you will look at this one frame, one thing that we can see is that there's a lot, there's only two colors being used and there's a lot of like white and dark pixels. And so instead of uh, displaying like seven dark pixels in a row with like red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue, what we can do is to start uh, writing one byte, which is a number of the pixel and then uh, the red, green, blue once. And then uh, we can basically like repeat it like this. And so this is a technique called run length encoding. So now this technique in itself is very useful for images with only two colors. But if you take a picture uh, with your camera, you're never going to be uh, to see two pixels next to each other with the exact same color. And uh, we're going to see next like how to help with this, but keep in mind that this is a building block uh, for compressing images uh, that's going to be used in the pipeline. So now the other strategy I'm going to talk about, you need to have like some imagination for this. So in this case, uh, we're going to think of the image not as a series of pixels, but as a continuous function. And one of the things we can do with a continuous function is to run a Fourier transform on top of this that's going to decompose this continuous function into an infinite sum of sinusoidal functions like sin and cos with some variation. So, okay, why would you want that? Like, how is it useful? So what you can see in the illustration is the first few uh, sinusoidal function, they actually end up being very close to the final function. And then like the more you go down into those, like those sinusoidal functions, the less information that they have. In practice, uh, if you just keep the first few and re-encode it back, you're going to get like very close image, but like you lose like a lot of the details that you may not uh, be able to perceive. Now, every single one of those is taking roughly the same amount of bits to encode. And so by doing this, you're able to reduce uh, the information that you have to encode in order to uh, compress the image. And the third technique I'm going to talk, you also need to uh, think about the image in a different way. In this case, a series of zero and ones. And so one of the things we can start observing is that some patterns are emerging. So for example, the sequence 0101 is there 15 times. Then the sequence 110 is only there like seven times. And then you keep going and at some point, some of them are only going to be there once. And the idea behind uh, the compression is you can do a remapping. You can remap 0101 to the bits zero. Then you can remap 110 to the two bits one zero. And then you keep doing, keep doing. And at some point, because you uh, mapped a bunch of things to smaller things, like some things will need to be mapped to like bigger things. But if you, uh, look at the entire like uh, sequences of zeros and ones, it's going to compress uh, using this technique if you also uh, add the uh, mapping table. So this is called Hoffman encoding. So those are like three building blocks in order to compress the image. And what is the result of this? We're able to get a 10x reduction in the size of the image. So going from like four megs, we're like for about 400K. And the name of this step is image compression. And the most popular like uh, image compressions uh, like out there are like uh, JPEG, WebP, PNG. And so this is like, they use all of those building blocks and a few more in order to uh, compress the image. 
So we've made like massive progress into getting the image to be smaller, but it's still like 20 uh, megabytes per second for our video. So this is like still too much. So what, what else can we do? So for this, we can think of our video as a series of images. But now what you can see is like all of the images like next to each other, like actually very, very close to each other. And so there's probably something we can do about it. So the first idea is uh, we're going to only, uh, we're going to like do a diff of like uh, the image like before and the image after and encode only the diff uh, using those uh, strategies before. And so this is working and this is giving better results, but we can do even better. What we can do is to start predicting uh, what the next image is going to be. And in this case, like the palm tree like goes from like the top left to the bottom right. And so you can start, and so you can start predicting what the next image is going to be, and then do the delta based on this prediction. And so this is uh, this step is called a video codec. And the most popular video codecs are H.264 and AVC, which are the same thing, but with a different name, like JavaScript and XMAScript. Then there's also AV1, uh, VP8, VP9. So this uh, video encoding is, sorry. So this video codec is able again to reduce uh, the size drastically. So in this case, this is how <coughs> our setup looks like. So we now have two types of frames. We have keyframes. So in this case, the first frame, uh, which is using something like JPEG uh, to compress it. And then we have delta frames. So in this case, like every one in this picture. And now in order to decode the video, it's no longer, oh, just give me like one image and I can do it. Now you need to start with the keyframe. And then uh, in order to decode the second one, you need to have decoded the keyframe, do the prediction where it's going to be next, and then uh, do the delta, uh, do the delta in order to like decode it. So now we are seeing that we need a stateful uh, API and in a specific order. But this is only one uh, part of the picture because the people doing video encoding and compression, they wanted to do even better. And one thing that they realized is that you can do like the uh, this optimization going forward, but you can also doing backwards. So you can start from the end, do like the prediction, the encoding, and then start looking at in which direction do we get the most savings and take the one that is actually going to be the smallest overall. And so this is where the notion of uh, bi-directional frames or B-frames comes in. So in this case, the frame number five is a B-frame, which means that in order to decode it, you need to decode uh, the number four and the number six. And in order to decode the number six, you need to like the seven, seven, you need eight, and eight, you need nine, and same in the other way. And so now uh, what you're seeing is, <laughs> In order to decode uh, the video sequence in order, you need to send uh, all of the frames in a different order. And this is where we have two notions of time. So we have the presentation time, which is the one that you expect uh, from like to see like uh, in the duration of the movie. And then the second one is the decoding timestamp. And so this is the timestamp at which you need to send the the frames in order to be decoded in the right order. And so this is where we've got like our first uh, truth, there's actually not a truth, where like time only goes forward. So now that we've seen uh, like the first uh, breaking stuff, uh, let's go back to uh, the API, like actually the real API. So in this case, we need to have some kind of load video API uh, to give us like all of the frames. And then we want like a, a decoder API. And so in this case, uh, the web codecs, like the browser is giving us a video decoder with a bunch of options, including one which is a callback on decoded frame. And so now you need to do decoder.decode, send it like the first frame, 
and then it's going to process and at some point it's going to give us a call or callback with the first image. And then we do it with the number two, number three, number four, and we're getting them in order. But now what happens like for our B frames? So now what we need to do is to send uh, the frame number nine and then the frame number eight and then the frame seven and six. But our callback is not going to be called. So not like it's as if nothing happened, but in fact, it's like a bunch of things happening behind the scene. And only when we send it the frame number five, now it's going to do the whole chain again and going to call all our frames in the right order uh, for us to be able to use. And so this is where like the truth number two is a lie. So if you're decoding one frame, you're not getting one frame back. So in practice, uh, you may get like zero or you get made five based on like how uh, the encoding have been, have been done. And so this is very mind bending because like all of the APIs I can think of, even the asynchronous API, when you call something is going to give it to you back after some time, but it's never like, oh, you're getting one or 10 or like zero and uh, very un in an unpredictable way. So now that we've seen another, tr another truth, let's go like even deeper. So let's think about like this load video API that I talked about. So how would you uh, encode all of this information? So now there's a lot of metadata that we need. So we need to have like, hey, how much time uh, uh, is a frame? Uh, like what are the list of frames? What are the types? Uh, what are their like timestamp? Uh, what are the dependencies between them? So there's a lot of metadata that needs to be stored. And so if we were to do it uh, today, you would probably uh, implement it in JSON. But all of those file formats have been uh, written like 20 years ago. And so they are all in binary, but the idea is the same. So what, are, what, what is this step called? So what is this thing called? Uh, this is called a video container. And so in practice, uh, like the four most known one are the MP4, Move, AVI, and MKV. And they all use different encoding and different way to represent this, but they all have like very similar information that is about like a container for like then calling the codec. And this step of reading these file formats and then sending all of the frames in the right order to the codec is called demuxing. So now uh, it's called uh, demuxing. So now let's talk a bit about performance. So what takes time in this whole thing? So in practice, the codec is the part that takes the most time. And one of the, and to, re, uh, to refresh your mind, like the codec is doing all of the image compression, decompression, all of the predictions, all of the delta, all of these encodings. And one of the ways to like think about it is uh, just look at the size of things. So the binary data is like in the tens to hundreds of kilobytes, but then the actual like metadata for each frame is like tens of characters. And so you can see like a very big uh, change. And this is so uh, like, uh, like time consuming and complicated and uh, needs to have so much performance that now there's hardware specialized uh, like units in the, like either like next to the CPU or like to the GPU that is doing all of the operation I, I mentioned, like uh, the fast Fourier transform, the Hoffman encoding and all those kind of things uh, in the hardware. And the reason why it's in the hardware is because just doing it in like the CPU normally, even like with the most handwritten like C++ code is, was not fast enough. And so now if you want to, to use Wasm, now you would have to like, not only have something not as fast because it's running on the CPU, but with some overhead for Wasm. And so doing this that way is going to be slower. And this is where like web, uh, web codex is very exciting, is that we are now able to use a JavaScript API, send all of those binary data, and the uh, web codec API is going to be using all of those hardware accelerated uh, functionalities. So this is exciting. 
Now, this is only one part of the equation. The second part is uh, we need to do like to read this file, like this binary file, like doing this DMX thing. Like, could we use Wasm for it? So again, uh, the story is a bit more less comp uh, more complicated. So the way Wasm works is it creates a new memory heap, like a memory space. And in order to call into it and to have its running job, you need to copy all of the information you want to, to this new space, then do its work and then copy and then give it back to you. And here we're talking about like hundreds of kilobytes, like megabytes and of megabytes uh, of information and do a copy for doing not a lot of work for decoding this and then copying it back and then sending it back to uh, the web, uh, to the web codec API. And so doing this copy actually nullifies any of the wins you may have uh, from uh, using Wasm, uh, which is faster. So this is where our third truth uh, becomes a lie, where uh, Wasm is not faster than using raw JavaScript uh, for video decoding. Now, one caveat I'm going to say is, in practice, for the demuxing, it's not part of the web codec API, it's not part of the browser, so you need to do it in user land. And there's so many uh, C++ APIs for demuxing that have been written over the years. And so for code reuse, it's actually a legit way to use Wasm for this, but it's actually not for performance reasons. So, now that we've debunked like the three uh, myths, and where are we at? And so in practice, I wish I ended the talk with like, hey, you can use this video editor with all of those functionalities. Unfortunately, we're not quite, I'm not quite there yet. What I've been able to do is to get like, uh, decode an entire video file and re-encode it without doing anything and in the browser. The good news is that one, it's actually possible and it works. And the second one is actually, it's actually fast. So because we're using the hardware um, accelerated features, it's as fast as using Final Cut Pro uh, in the browser. So the perf is there, the capability is there, but the issue is like actually doing it takes like hundreds of lines of like very in the weeds code that is very hard to debug and needs to understand like all of the things I talked to you so far. And so this is where uh, like my call to action to every one of you is, is we need to have a jQuery of video editing in the browser. And we need to have like clean up the API and like package it in a way to have like the like uh, like make it able to do a video editor with AI possible. And so, are you going to be the one to build it? This is my call to action. Thank you. Have a good day.